Hello friends and welcome back to the channel. In today's video I'm setting up a new miniature ecosystem, a paludarium jar inspired by the side lakes of the Danube River. We'll go step by step, from exploring the lush riverside and forest, to collecting moss, plants, rocks and water, to arranging the land and water sections of the jar. And of course, we'll meet all the fascinating creatures that will call this tiny world home. From peaceful grazers like copepods, to adventurous little rubber ducky isopods, and even a few sneaky planaria worms. We'll also explore how the plants grow and interact with their new home. Let's dive right in! Saturday morning, around 11 a.m and the city is slowly waking up. From this bridge over the Danube, the first sound is a tractor rumbling past, loud and heavy, shaking the air. But once it fades, the river takes center stage. The Danube stretches out wide and calm, birds calling in the distance, ducks and geese gliding on the water. Standing here feels like the perfect starting point, a reminder of the scale of this river. and the smaller, hidden worlds we'll be searching for today. Just a short drive from here lies the quiet side lake of the Danube. This river, stretching nearly 2,900 kilometers across Europe, is second only to the Volga in length. And today, I'm collecting just a tiny fragment of its vast ecosystem. As I walk down towards the lake, the setting shifts. Wide, lush green lawn leads to the sandy beach, clearly shaped by people. But just beyond it, nature is waiting to take over. The rain from this morning has left everything fresh and alive, the air thick with that earthy smell. Right at the shoreline, the first animal appears. A small frog, so perfectly camouflaged among the algae and water plants, that it almost disappears into the background. It's a reminder that even in places where we leave our footprint, life is always adapting and hiding in plain sight. Dipping the camera below the surface reveals something even more striking, an intact underwater ecosystem. Plants, algae and countless unseen creatures are busy at work here, forming the foundation of the world we'll take just a small piece of for our jar later. A little further along, another frog lies motionless near the shore. I gently check with my finger if it's alive, but it doesn't move, so I leave it be. Amphibians like this have delicate skin coated with protective slime, and touching them in the wild can harm that layer. Sometimes, the best way to appreciate them is simply to step back and let them be. The first materials for today's jar aren't found in the water, but here in the nearby deciduous forest. This is a classic woodland, green and full of life in summer, but in just three months, all of this will be bare, grey and leafless as winter takes over. Not far from the path, I come across a thick stick. It may look simple, but inside a jar ecosystem it adds a structure, a miniature landscape feature. And over time, as it slowly decomposes, it becomes a valuable food source for fungi, microbes and even small grazers. Crunching through layers of dead leaves and fallen branches, the forest floor suddenly opens up to exactly what I was searching for. A bright green patch of moss. Mosses are pioneers. They thrive where other plants struggle, creating a soft carpet that can hold moisture and shelter tiny organisms. I carefully take a small portion, just enough for the project, leaving the rest untouched so this little ecosystem stays balanced. Back at my transport container, I gather everything and then stop at a nearby tree. Its bark is covered with moss, and here I scrape off a small piece of dead bark. Along with some dry branches from the ground. Together, these will form the land section of our paludarium jar, a miniature forest within glass built from the leftovers of a much larger wood. Next, it's time to collect plants and rocks for the water section of our jar ecosystem. The very first plant I come across is something I've never seen before. The Puris vulgaris, also called mare's tail. It's an aquatic plant that grows in shallow ponds and streams, whether the water is calm or flowing. Its upright shoots look almost like miniature pine trees, and in a jar, they can provide shelter and oxygen for small animals. Right beside it, 
I use my tiny rake to dig out some of the rocks that make up this natural beach. They not only anchor the design of the jar later, but also provide surface area for biofilm and microorganisms to grow. Along the edge, I also spot another species, the needle spike rush, a delicate grass-like plant that thrives in wetlands and shallow waters. Finally, I take my small transport bucket and scoop up a mix of lake water and dirt. It may not look pretty, but this dirty water is exactly what we need. It's packed with microfauna, the invisible pioneers that will jumpstart our jar ecosystem back home. To keep plants safe, I transfer the mare's tail and needle spike rush into the smaller water container, while the larger one is reserved for the heavier rocks. That way, nothing gets crushed during the two hour drive back to my home in Heilbronn. With both containers secured, it's time to head home and bring this little piece of the Danube back to life in a glass. Two hours later, I'm back in my apartment in Heilbronn. Before anything else, I make sure this glass is perfectly clean and dry. This jar is actually special. It was a wedding gift for my friends Chris and Charlotte. Originally filled with sand and money, now it will serve as the foundation for a living ecosystem. I begin by placing the first rocks from the lake shore, viewing them firmly to the bottom. This creates a stable barrier between the land and water sections. The glue I'm using is plant and animal safe, bought from a local fish store. On top of the base stones, I position a larger yellow rock, giving the hardscape more height and structure. To add balance, I place one of the smaller tree branches we collected earlier. Finally, I fill the gaps and cracks between the rocks with leftover aqua soil from a previous aquascape project. This soil will provide nutrients for plants and help anchor everything in place. With the foundation set, the jar is ready for the next layers of life. Next, I add the very first plant to the jar, the needle spike rush. This grass-like species thrives in the transition between land and water. I place it right at the bottom of the jar, letting the leftover soil clinging to its roots settle in naturally. Instantly, it gives the setup a kind of miniature jungle atmosphere. To secure it firmly, I wedge it between a few smaller rocks, making sure it won't shift as the ecosystem evolves. Then comes one of my favorite touches, thick patches of moss, collected earlier from the forest floor and from the tree bark. Still moist from the woods, the moss brings a lush green carpet into the jar. It not only adds beauty, but also creates a perfect grazing ground for the land-dwelling inhabitants we'll meet later. At this stage, the jar already feels alive, a vibrant little world beginning to take shape. With all the plants in place, it's time to finish the look of our miniature landscape. I carefully add a layer of fine white sand to the bottom, creating a bright little beach inside the jar. To make sure the sand reaches every crack and space between the rocks and wood, I use the back of a spoon to gently wiggle it in. For the final touches, I place a few smaller branches along with the thick tree branch we collected earlier by the roadside. To me, it looks like a tiny dead tree giving this world a natural sense of scale. Before adding the lake water, I need to clean the sand off the surfaces. For that, I'll use a really advanced high-tech cleaning tool. Which brings me to the sponsor of today's video. I'm just kidding. I'm using a 50 cent toothbrush from the grocery store. It works perfectly and no product placement is needed here. But if you want to actually support the channel, just hit like, subscribe and share this video with a friend. But now back to the video. For adding the lake water, there's a little aquascaping hack. Just place some plastic foil on top of your jar. I'm using baking paper here since it's clean and it doesn't soak through. Then I gently pour in the water so the sand, aqua soil and rocks stay perfectly in place. Once the jar is filled, I simply remove the paper. Now for the final touches. I'm adding Hippuris vulgaris or mare's tail into both the land and water sections of the jar, since I'm not sure where this species will grow better. Using a planting stick, I push the roots deep into the substrate. Last look and the jar ecosystem is complete. In the evening of the very same day, I take a closer look at the jar. What you're seeing here is a sped up version of the mare's tail. It almost looks like the plant is moving in real time. Maybe it really is adjusting ever so slightly to the new light source. The water was still murky on that first day. 
but by the next morning it had cleared up beautifully. And with that clarity, a hidden world appeared. Tiny specks darting through the water. Copepods. These little crustaceans are among the most abundant animals on Earth. In fact, scientists estimate that copepods in the ocean outweigh all the fish combined. But they don't just live in the sea. Germany's lakes, rivers and even puddles are full of them. Here you can often find species like Cyclops trinus or Oidiaptomus gracilis. They are fast swimmers using their long antennae like tiny paddles. And they play a vital role in every aquatic food web. Grazing on algae and bacteria and in turn becoming prey for fish, amphibians or insect larvae. So while they are barely visible to the naked eye, copepods are true ecosystem engineers. And now they've taken up residence in this miniature world inside a glass jar. One night later, curiosity gets the better of me and I check out the jar once more. If you switch on the light in the middle of the night, the whole miniature world suddenly comes alive. Tiny shapes moving everywhere. And among them, a creature you definitely wouldn't want in your fish tank. A planarium worm. These flatworms belong to the class Tubalaria. And while they may look harmless, they can become real nightmares in aquariums. Planaria are opportunistic predators and scavengers. They feed on tiny invertebrates, fish eggs, and sometimes even weakened animals. Their secret weapon is a muscular, expandable pharynx that they push out of their body like a tube to literally suck the juices out of their prey. What makes them especially frightening is their incredible regenerative ability. Cut a planarian in half and both halves can regrow into complete new worms. In fact, scientists have cut them into dozens of pieces and each piece grew into a whole new world. Almost like something of a science fiction. But of course, not every inhabitant of this jar is that sinister. As I keep watching, I also spot a mayfly nymph, swimming gracefully among the plants. Mayfly nymphs are among the most ancient winged insects on Earth. In their nymph stage, they can live for months to years underwater, grazing on algae and detritus, keeping the ecosystem clean in the process. And yet, once they finally transform into adults, their life above water is fleeting, sometimes lasting only a single day. I've kept many mayfly nymphs in my Necker bowl insect jar before, so if you want to learn more about them, check out the video linked in the top right corner. So here, side by side, we find two extremes of survival strategy. The nearly immortal regenerating flatworm and the delicate mayfly nymph preparing for one of the shortest adult lives in the insect world. About one and a half weeks later, it's time to prepare the jar for our next inhabitants. But before we meet them, some small remodeling is needed. Our new guests will need a larger land section, and I want to reduce the risk of them accidentally drowning. So, carefully, I siphon out part of the water and add it to my balcony pond, with a little bucket filled with water and plants. After that, I give the jar glass one more thorough cleaning making sure everything is clear and ready for the next stage. So now, it's time for the unboxing of our new inhabitants. I carefully remove the transport tape and open the box with a pair of scissors. Taking care not to cut too deep so nothing inside gets hurt. Once open, I gently pull out the next transport container hidden inside the package. And if you're able to read this label here, you'll know exactly what we're adding to the jar next. Rubber duckies. I open the lid of the rubber ducky transport container and immediately notice something special. The company that sent them added one extra isopod, which is a nice bonus, especially since each rubber ducky cost me around 9 euros or 12 US dollars. The first thing I want to do is check if they survived the transport and confirm that they actually sent the right species. I carefully flip over the small piece of egg crate that was included in the container and spot the first little rubber ducky. To some people, isopods might seem a bit disgusting. But I find these rubber duckies fascinating. Their color patterns are way more striking than the regular roly-poly 
and they are they are a little larger too. Next, I open the lid of the Danube jar and gently take out some of the sphagnums, which the rubber duckies cling to. I place this moss directly into the jar ecosystem. It gives them a familiar spot to hide at the start and I can always remove it later if it doesn't fit the look of the jar. I also add the small transport paper because separating the isopods from it can be tricky. With the help of my spoon, I carefully tease the paper apart from the last rubber ducky so it can finally start exploring its new miniature world. The first large rubber ducky begins exploring the interface between land and water. I was a bit worried it might fall in, but to my surprise it senses the water immediately and doesn't enter it. It's fascinating to see the contrast between the massive rubber ducky and the tiny copepods swimming in the water column below. Meanwhile, another rubber ducky is investigating the cave section of the ecosystem, showing a clear interest in the biofilm growing on the rocks. And the third rubber ducky has climbed on into the canopy section, carefully navigating the moss and branches as if surveying its new world. Returning to the first rubber ducky, now attempting to climb the rocks, I want to share a few interesting facts about these creatures. First, rubber duckies are nocturnal by nature. They are most active at night, which is why their movements in the jar are so deliberate and slow. Second, they breathe through small gill-like structures on the underside of their body, which is why they must stay in humid or damp environments. And third, rubber duckies have an incredible ability to sense vibrations and chemical cues in their surroundings, allowing them to detect potential predators, food sources and even other isopods nearby. Watching them interact with this miniature ecosystem is like observing tiny explorers navigating a world much larger than themselves. They are detrivores, meaning they feed primarily on decaying plant matter, biofilm and microorganisms, which makes this jar ecosystem a perfect home for them. Plenty of moss, rocks and decomposing leaves to graze on. They reproduce through egg laying, often in small clusters hidden in damp soil or under moss. So in a well-established ecosystem, they can slowly increase their population naturally. Native to the rainforests of Thailand, these isopods are highly adaptable to humid and semi-aquatic environments. Which is why the interface between land and water in this jar is ideal, I hope. With the right humidity, temperature and plenty of hiding spots, they thrive and display natural behaviors like climbing, grazing and social interaction. Watching them move through this miniature world, exploring caves, climbing rocks and investigating the canopy gives you a real sense of how perfectly suited they are to this ecosystem. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to support the channel and get even closer to our aquatic adventures, consider joining the Guppy Gang. For just $2.99 per month, you get early access to videos, exclusive sneak peeks and a unique batch of perks that can't be found anywhere else. And before you go, don't forget to check out my video on the right hand side where I added tiny aquatic insects to the Neka jar ecosystem. It's full of tiny aquatic adventures and you won't want to miss it. Thanks for watching.